Hey guys, it is an absolutely beautiful day outside today. The first day we've had where it's not pouring down, raining, thundering, and lightning. The sun is out, the breeze is breezing, the birds are singing. So I thought it would be a great day to record the narration for this watercolor illustration. So I'm sitting outside enjoying nature while I'm narrating this very na nature inspired watercolor illustration. So I did the sketch digitally in Photoshop. Well, first I did the concept in my sketchbook, but then I took it into Photoshop, cleaned it up, tightened it up. That's my general working method these days because it allows me to resize things and to adjust layers and to do multiple layers. So for me, that's working. Then I printed it onto watercolor paper, a cotton rag watercolor paper using my blue line technique, which I will link for you guys so you don't miss out on it. And uh, then I assembled my watercolors. So this is what the finished piece looks like. This is one of my favorite illustrations in a while. I feel like it kind of captures that magical springtime sunshiny quality. And that's what I mean when I'm talking about how cartooning can sometimes be more realistic than realism. It's a lot about conveying emotion and capturing the essence, which is something I feel that drawing realistically can sometimes fail to do. So I'm I'm really excited to be able to share this tutorial with you guys today. So I have my illustration stretched. It's been stretched on a gator board. I'm using blue tape to hold it down in place. It's also been penciled. So we've already had a chance to remove our blue lines and I spritzed a little bit of water onto my watercolor palette just to activate my colors. And I'm starting with a cool yellow and applying a wash around the round, leaving the center open. And then I'm gonna go in and spritz that to get some movement, to get some dimension. And just to encourage a little bit more of that movement, I'm using a large round watercolor brush and some clean water to kind of spread it in some more. I allowed that layer to dry fully and then I came back to it a few hours later and I have here it's either indigo or a very dark phthalo blue and I'm kind of just brushing it in and using the clean water in a spritzer bottle to get it to move around a bit. And one of the things I really love is I love the kind of greens, the really lush, vibrant, magical greens you can get from combining a cool yellow with a cool blue. And I really love how much movement and how much chaos we can get by using a spritzer bottle to encourage some water movement and then going in and dabbing in a darker, more saturated version of the color that we had before. So for my mixing palette, I'm just using an inexpensive ceramic plate from good old Dollar Tree. It is honestly one of my favorite art supplies very underappreciated so I got to appreciate it here so I'm going in with my cool yellow and I am adding some more and I felt like it gotten too cool it gotten too blue I want to warm it up liven it up get some green layering going on so I'm going back in with the yellow and kind of repainting it painting in highlights adding in some sunshine and some depth I allowed that to dry and then well mostly dry and then I splatter on some of that blue paint so we can get some more chaos we can get some more movement going that's one of the things I really like about this piece it's a whole lot of chaos in the beginning and then towards the end we really tighten it up so I'm splattering in some I think it's yellow but it might be the darker blue using a smaller brush so with spatter techniques like this one the larger a brush you use the bigger the splats you're gonna get and the more water you use the more splats you're gonna get so if you want really small dark splats Use a smaller brush with a thicker concentration of paint. If you want large dark splats, use a larger brush with a thicker concentration of paint. But it does need to be thin enough that it'll actually leave the brush. So once that had a chance to dry, I'm going in with a different palette. This is a, actually a watercolor palette. It's a ceramic watercolor palette. And I'm using a mauve mixed with a bit of purple to start rendering in some of those thistles. And all of the plants depicted here are, for the most, I think they're all native Louisiana plants or common Louisiana plants. So we've got clover, we've got thistle, we've got morning glories, we've got some of those little lawn daisies that you get, a few different types of those 
since you know seven inch carrot is set in southeast louisiana and i do want to make it a point to actually depict the environment you know realistically and yes while i can step outside and look in the yard and see what's growing there and i often do that for reference as well i can also google plants native to southeast louisiana so for the morning glories i am using a very very thin mix of a cool pink it's one made by Magello. I think it's Campos Rose, if I'm thinking correctly. So it's not as fugitive as, say, Opera or Opera Rose, but it's also not as fun as Opera Rose. Opera Rose is just really fun. So for this illustration, you guys are going to see me going in, doing something, fiddling, fiddling, fiddling around with it, letting it dry, maybe spritzing it. I was kind of just playing around and experimenting a lot and trying to keep things loose and moving. I wanted a lot of the colors to kind of be in other parts of the painting. It kind of creates this like almost like a color harmony thing. It's hard to explain. It just feels good to the brain to look at it. I'm sure there's a scientific explanation for that. I just don't have the background in that. So the basic gist of what I'm doing here is I applied my background colors for the clovers, my yellows, my blues. I made a whole mess of it. I let it mostly dry. Now I'm applying my base colors for the flowers, so pinks and yellows. I'm splattering some of them. I'm spraying some of them. I'm trying to get them to move around a little bit. I'm basically kind of placing my base local colors and then I'm going to work on kind of rendering around that. So now that my morning glories have had a chance to dry I'm gonna add another layer of dark pink and kind of blend that out and if y'all can hear that screaming in the background I don't know what's going on one of my neighbors has a pool and for some reason little kids think screaming like they're being murdered as they jump into the pool is like the correct way to scream when you're jumping into a pool so I promise you no one's in danger they're having a really good time and I'm not sure if it can pick it up or not because it's kind of funny what these lavalier mics can pick up the things I would think it could tune out it like really hones in on and then the things I would think you could hear it completely ignores so I'm just throwing that out there. No one's in danger, nobody's dying, but the wind sure is picking up. So I find that by establishing my local colors kind of early on, it helps me figure out my color palette if I don't have one in mind already. For this one, I did have a, I kind of had one in mind. Uh, it took me so long to finish this piece that, you know, you could start with one and then kind of lose it, but I knew kind of what I wanted because I knew what colors those flowers were going to be. But I wanted to establish those colors first and then use that to help me figure out what colors I wanted to use for Kara's dress. So I'm leaving her kind of unrendered while I do all the wet, loose, messy work um, because it's honestly just easier to correct that after the fact. Like it's easier to kind of hide when you get blue on somebody's face before you paint them than it is after you've painted them and you're trying to clean that blue up. So it just makes it a little bit easier on me. So one of the things I like about some of the yellows I've been using lately is that most of them are semi-transparent to semi-opaque. So they've got some opacity to them. So they actually stand up to layering back and forth. They're not gonna be completely translucent, which means like with this dandelion here where you have a really dark background and some of the details of the dandelion have gotten lost into that blue, you can go in and add layers of yellow and kind of pull that back out. That's something that in general you might wanna use wash for to help pull those layers back in but with these semi-opaque watercolors you can do that to an extent as well that's actually something that I really liked about the Mei Liang watercolors so if you guys haven't watched that unboxing swatch review and that field test I hope you will because I think you'll enjoy it So in the past, when I used to sit on the floor and paint, I would have been flipping and flopping this illustration all over the place to get the best angle for my wrist, the best angle for the lines that I want to pull. Doing years of recording for YouTube where you can't really move it around a whole lot lest people get motion sickness, I've kind of built up some skills where I don't have to do that. But if you need to do it, please do that by all means necessary. Move your painting to an angle that best suits you. I also propped my painting up a couple of inches. This actually affects how the pigments settle onto the paper. And not only that, it makes it a little bit easier for me to see. So I'm just using 
shoot a bottle of probably gelatin sizing to help prop it up. So at this point, I can start adding in some of the stems and leaves from the non-clover plants. And I wanted something that would, I didn't want it to just be a sea of one color. So I'm using olive greens and warmer greens for that. So now that I have most of my local colors figured out, I can start applying color to Kara. And since I have those morning glory, really they're primroses. I was always told they're morning glories, but they're actually evening primroses. Um, now that I have those primroses kind of established in and we've got something there, there, there's a pattern there. I'm going to use Kara's dress as kind of the completion of that pattern as though she was one of the primroses. And I'm using Compose Rose and as I need darker colors, I'm mixing in a little bit of naphthamide maroon. So normally with my watercolor tutorials, I don't really like talking too much about which colors exactly I'm using because what I want to do is I don't want to tell you like just go out and buy this palette and you can paint exactly the way I did and look exactly what I did because I don't feel like people really learn from that. Um, and there's plenty of that out there online already. I don't need to contribute to that. What I prefer to do is I like to talk about how I think about color, what I'm looking for in color, what I want the colors to do as they react, because I feel like that I'm arming you with knowledge and you can take that knowledge and turn around and paint something of your own. You don't have to have the exact palette that I'm using. So while that doesn't make me particularly appealing to art supply companies, since I use whatever brands I like in whatever configurations I like, I'm not specific or loyal to one brand, I feel like that allows me to create more realistic tutorials, frankly, because it's a better reflection of what most people are going to be painting with. They're going to be painting with whatever they have and whatever they like. So it allows me to create tutorials that help people use what they already have. So with this, I would recommend avoiding student grade watercolors. Student grade watercolors just don't handle the way professional grade watercolors do and there are plenty of really great affordable professional grade options out on the market. I've got reviews for several of them but if you're looking to get started Paul Rubens and PWC both make really great affordable professional grade watercolors that'll allow you to achieve most of the techniques that I showed you guys here. So at this point, I'm still working on establishing my flowers, establishing those colors, trying to kind of pull them from the mess that I made with all the blues and yellow. That was an intentional mess. I feel like it really oh, is so magical about starting with a mess and being able to pull some order out of it while still leaving it a bit of a mess. And as someone who has kind of a clean cartoony style, my work can start to look very coloring book. So I love breaking out of the mold and doing stuff that is very not coloring book. So that was my goal with this. And plus it gives it this really magical sunlit feel. So it's really all about the layers and utilizing how the paints work. So like I said, we've got a cool, slightly opaque yellow. I'm using that now on the clover to paint in some highlights, the areas where the sun would be hitting the clover. This is creating some depth. This is creating some contrast. So yellows, warmer colors, even a cool yellow is warmer than a blue, for example. So you got to think about it as a scale, but warmer colors are going to feel like they're coming to the viewer, whereas cooler colors kind of recede away from the viewer. So this can be a great way to create some perspective, to create some depth, even if you are not great at linear perspective, atmosphere, atmospheric perspective is your friend. I've got some tutorials on utilizing atmospheric perspective over on YouTube. I'll be sure to link them for you guys. I wish they got more love because I think they are pretty good tutorials and it's a great way, even if you're not super confident with your draftsmanship skills, it's a great way to create that feeling of depth and to create that feeling of telling a story and creating a world. And some of us need all the tools, tips, tricks, and techniques that we can get our hands on. So now that I've added in that yellow, I've started creating some depth. I've started establishing what those clovers are going to look like. I'm going in and I'm just kind of nitpicking, adding some details to the flowers, adding some darker browns. And I'm also going in and adding a lighter wash of a phthalo blue to start establishing 
our clover. And I'm utilizing both positive and negative techniques. So in that, okay, so positive painting is when you're actually painting the shapes that you want to be seen. Negative painting is when you paint everything but the shapes you want to be seen so that they then come forward. But I'm using both of those techniques here to create the darker clovers. So sometimes you'll see me painting petals. Sometimes you'll see me kind of painting around and reserving petals. It's kind of whatever works to create the depth that I want. And you know, for those clover, I only use two colors. I, or for the most part, I only use two colors. I use a cool yellow and I use the phthalo blue. And it's all about the proportions and how you handle the paint. So you don't have to have a huge palette of paints to be able to paint. I mean, you can do a lot with color mixing. You can also do a lot with optical mixing where you're layering the colors in such a way that they create new colors. So a little bit of color theory, a little bit of understanding how your paints handle can really go a long way, which is why I recommend if you're new to watercolor, you've just acquired your first watercolor set, I recommend you paint some watercolor grids. I'll show you guys how to do that, but that's gonna really give you a good idea of how your paints can glaze and how they can layer, how well they take that without turning to mud. Because for me, with as many layers, as many glazes as I do, I really need my watercolors to not turn to mud. I don't mind if the colors move and shift a little bit, but I want those pigments to stay clean and clear and bright. And you guys can really see, I mean, it takes a lot of patience. This is a very time consuming effort, well worth it. And I really enjoyed it, but you guys can see how we're actually creating the clover using one color on top of this mess of beautiful color and two watercolor techniques, positive painting and negative painting. And for the vast majority of my watercolors, I use the same brushes over and over and over and over again. I've tried loads of different brushes. I have lots of different brushes, but primarily I paint mostly with round watercolor brushes. And I find myself increasingly just using the silver black velvet watercolor brushes for the majority of my watercolors. They're a mix of synthetic and natural fibers. They handle quite well. They've got the best qualities of both. They're very easy to care for. They're just great all around watercolor brushes. If you are just starting your watercolor journey or if you're looking to level up your supplies, y'all, I can't recommend these enough. I don't, they don't know I exist. We don't have any kind of a partnership. I just happen to really, really like them. They really get the job done and they are more affordable than their full natural hair counterparts. Now, generally, unless you have an ethical issue with using fur and I completely understand where you're coming from, generally I find that natural hair performs better than synthetic. It holds water better. I can pull a clean, crisp line better. It's not gonna drip drop water all over my paper the way synthetics tend to. These do not have any of those problems. I really like them and I highly recommend them. And I have sent them out to so many watercolor friends. Like you gotta try this, it's actually really great. So I did say I don't flip flop my watercolor illustrations all around anymore. I did have to flip this one so that I could paint the clover without dragging my wrist all over the illustration and without um, straining my wrist. So I try to keep it pretty, pretty um, not nauseating when I flip my canvas. I try to minimize the amount of times I do it. You know, even editing the video, I'm like, oh, I can't quite get my bearings. But I did need to flip it in this instance because it allowed me to reach things that otherwise it would have been a real struggle to reach. I do have an illustrator's bridge. Um, I do like it. I don't use it enough, mostly because it, it, I don't have a very big desk and all the watercolor supplies plus an illustrator's bridge plus trying to record it is just a lot going on but i'm hoping that when i have a larger desk i can pull it out and actually utilizing use utilize it because hovering my wrist over the illustration does create a lot of wrist strain it's pretty challenging to do and i don't always pull the best lines that i could but it does keep my wrist out of the wet paint it keeps me from smearing paint all over the place and it prevents me from getting the illustration dirty so you know there are pros and cons to that but usually when you guys see me using a blotter sheet when i'm drawing or inking something it's for that reason just to prevent smearing uh to prevent me from dirtying the paper and this really but as i'm watching this i'm like this really was a time consuming process to do it but i just love how it turned out it's like magic 
and I'm spritzing along the edges so that I have kind of a diffused blend out into the environment, blend out into the edges of the page so it's not as sharp, not as crisp. So it's a little bit more ethereal, a little bit more magical, a little less realistic. I'm also spraying it so it goes up into her dress so I have that color influence from our background colors. That's something that I feel like watercolor does so beautifully that you can't necessarily do with other mediums. Like if you're working digitally, for example, you would have to work so hard to fake this. And with watercolor, in many ways, it just comes very naturally once you have the right combination of brush, paper, and paint. And uh, if you guys are interested in hearing what I think is the perfect combination of brush, paper, and paint, let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to talk about it with you guys. I do have my own opinions, but I also want to caveat that I think every artist has their own favorites and that it's really gonna depend on what kind of art you're making. A plein air artist is gonna have different needs than a watercolor comic artist like myself, who's gonna have different needs from a realistic watercolor artist who's gonna have different needs from a more abstract, atmospheric artist. We all work differently. And that's why it's so important to have such a variety of voices and different types of artists here on YouTube and online as well. So just because I love something does not mean the other watercolor artists on here are gonna love it. And just because they recommend something doesn't mean it's gonna work well for watercolor comics. So now that my first layer has had a chance to dry, you can really see the clover starting to come together. Oh y'all, I normally don't say this about my art, but it does, it looks so good. I'm so pleased with how this piece turned out. It makes me really happy. I felt like, you guys know when you kind of been hitting a wall and then you kind of figure something out that helps you get past that wall and you're kind of surprised that you did it and you're like, yeah, I did pretty good this time. This piece is one of those pieces for me. So let me have my moment. It's important to try to love your own art because you are your own first audience. You have to impress yourself first before you can really start impressing other people. And by poisoning those moments for yourself, from taking away those moments and saying, oh, I don't wanna be vain, you're actually hindering your artistic development because if you never like anything you make, you're not gonna really take a lot of chances. So to further establish the shadows here, I'm using indigo just in, in places to kind of create more contrast, to kind of create more depth. You don't wanna do it everywhere because then you lose that contrast, you lose that depth, you lose that storytelling. So you wanna be kind of strategic. Generally, I'm kind of placing it beneath the leaves and leaving the top where the sunlight is more likely to hit the leaves kind of open and and kind of lighter. So even though I don't have a specific light source in mind in general, basically it's radiating from the center of our watercolor round, I am thinking about light and how light would be hitting these objects and how they would be affecting these objects the whole time. So I wanna kinda of take a minute to talk about how social media influences the art we create. This illustration took about four days to paint and I was really happy with it. I really like it. But social media pushes us to share something new every single day and that prevents many of us from creating these larger, more time consuming pieces because we just can't push them out that fast. So. It's a difficult balancing act between creating art that will do well on social media, that satisfies those algorithms, that helps you build a following. And building a following can be important because for many of us, that's how we find work. For many of us who have styles that are not necessarily what's currently the most popular or what's seen in publishing, having a large following can help convince editors and publishers to take a chance on us. I mean, how many unqualified to write YouTubers have books out
So, you know, there it is important to have some following if you can, but creating work that satisfies the needs of social media is very challenging because when you create time-consuming pieces like this using traditional media, you just can't quite meet that schedule the way Instagram, YouTube, Twitter might want you to. And then after you've spent so many hours working on something and then you share it, if it doesn't do well, it kind of discourages you from putting that time in in the future. So if you want to create your own original art, your own original characters and tell your own stories, you really have to figure out how to ignore that. And I don't mean ignore that once or twice, I mean ignore that for years, which is definitely a challenge. So now that I've finished kind of rendering the clover, I'm going in and finally painting Kara and adding details to her. So one of the things I started with was further rendering her dress using more of that compose rose with a bit of naphthamide maroon, which is kind of a dark, cool maroon that's not quite a purple. It's a color I use all the time for skin tones. For her skin, I'm using a mix of yellow ochre with scarlet. Um, that's just my own personal preference for lighter skin tones. Everybody's kind of got their own. It's one that I really like because I find that it doesn't have a tendency to turn inks muddy and it's very easy to mix. And most watercolor sets have a scarlet and a yellow ochre. So it's just kind of a good basic skin tone that I happen to like. And if you're interested in learning how to watercolor other skin tones, I've got lots of tutorials where I talk about just that. So I'll make sure to link that for you guys. So with watercolor, usually I'll start out with kind of establishing the environment, establishing the tone, the mood, and the background. So like we did with the yellows and blues here. And then I will either work from most important things to least important things, or I will work from larger objects to smaller objects, or I will work from objects I'm not super sure what colors they will be to things I know and I paint often. So that's one of the reasons I left Kara kind of towards the end. I wanted to see how all the other colors went so that I could adjust my color palette for her since she's an established character from my comic, Seven Inch Kara, which I hope you guys are reading. You can read it for free at sevenincharacom or you can order your own copies of volume one and volume two from the Natto shop. I'll be sure to link that for you guys. And if you read it and you like it, it sure would mean a lot to me. If you let me know what you thought of it, you can leave a review on Amazon or on Goodreads, I sure would appreciate it. As a small business and a small creator, that is one of the best ways you can help me out and help me continue to create work. So on that note, I paint bees very frequently as well, my little buzzy friends. So I already knew how I wanted to handle the bees. I knew what kind of color palette I wanted to use. So I used a lot of warmer yellows as well as browns. I know people often think of bees as being yellow and black, but if you reference bees, if you look at reference, which I am doing as I'm working on this, I do that for the flowers, I do that for the plants, I do that for the bees. When I'm painting natural things, I really love having that reference up to inspire and guide my work. That way, even though my work is very cartoony, there's a lot of notes of realism to it, you know, trying to blend how I see the world with how the world actually is. But if you look at reference for bees, you'll notice that they're more of like a soft, kind of goldenish brown that kind of progresses to a dark brown or a black and it really can depend on the lighting. So for this illustration because we have all that beautiful sunlight kind of peeping through all the foliage I wanted to make sure that our bees were kind of golden. So while that's drying I'm going in and adding some more contrast adding some more details to the clover around Kara and this is also the stage where I start kind of finessing things nitpicking things I'll kind of go back and work things that have been worked already several times because I want to make sure that detail balance is just right and this is something I've really struggled with not everything can or should have the same level of detail when you do everything with the same level of detail yes it looks it looks you know, very realistic to some people, but you, the reader doesn't know what's important. They don't know what to focus on. They don't know what they should be paying attention to. So you want things that are not as important to have not as much detail. In photography, you would use focus 
for this so you would adjust the focus so that things that are less important have a softer focus you can do the same thing with art and illustration this is particularly important in comics where we're always trying to direct the reader's eye we're always trying to direct their attention as part of the storytelling so we're going to use color we're going to use contrast we're going to use pattern we're going to use detail we're going to use expression we're going to use all the tools in our toolkit to make reading our comics as easy as possible and with watercolor comics that can sometimes be a challenge because with black and white you have fewer tools at your disposal but sometimes having fewer tools allows you to create something with greater impact whereas when you have more tools at your disposal then you have to think harder about how to utilize those tools So another important aspect of how I handle watercolor is thinking about fat over lean. And this is a term I've stolen from oil painting, but basically for me, this means really thin washes. Those are what we start out with. That's, we do a lot of those at first, and then we work our way up in saturation. We work our way up in water to paint ratio where we're increasing the ratio of paint and binder. Because if you apply a really thick mix of something and then you try to glaze over it with another color even if it's dried for a long period of time there's a strong chance that it's going to reactivate and it's going to turn kind of muddy so when i'm painting faces when i'm painting people when i'm painting animals i save those smaller details that would be best served by using a smaller brush and a thicker application of paint i save those all the way to the end because that way, if I need to add you know, more blush to the cheeks, it's not gonna reactivate the eyelashes and I'm gonna get brown or black kind of streaking into the face where I don't want it. So it really allows me to better control my paint and better control my application of paints. I say this, you know, but I'm also sprinkling in some additional color. I think I'm sprinkling in some cooler, lighter yellow, trying to get a little bit more chaos back in, a little bit more light, like light motes are kind of falling from the sky. And you guys will see that I have flipped the illustration again so that Kara is closest to me, the viewer. It's just easier for me to paint the details. So technically she's upside down there. So with a painting like this, it's really important for you to be as patient as possible, give it time to dry, but also give your brain time to kind of adjust to the things that you've made. So with watercolor, things often look very different as they dry. Colors can shift, the paper kind of tightens up, and something that looked like a muddy mess while it was wet sometimes looks a whole lot better once the pigments have had a chance to settle, once the paper has had a chance to tighten up, and once everything's had a chance to dry. And I, a long time ago, I wrote a blog post about pushing through what I call the ugly phase. That's the part of the illustration where for many people who don't paint as much, they might want to throw in the towel. They're really unhappy with how it's looking. They just want to give up on it. 
And I encourage y'all in that post to try, just push through, give yourself a break and come back to it because sometimes you can make really great art by just pushing through the ugly phase. And at the worst, you've probably learned some new techniques, some new ways of handling things, some new things of fixing things, and you probably have some ideas for your next piece. Now I know sometimes when you've been making a lot of pieces that just aren't turning out the way you want them to, it's hard to keep that in mind. It's hard to stay encouraged. So if you are looking for some art positivity, if you're looking for a friendly community of artists where you can share your art and you can contribute to an art community, I invite you to join my Discord server, The Paint Box. It is an art-centric Discord server and everyone there is very nice. And I have a very active role in this server. So if you're looking for a friendly community to share your work, I invite you to join mine and I'll have a link down in the description below for you guys. So at this point, I'm just going in with probably a dark indigo, adding in some details, adding in some shadows. I'm trying to adjust the contrast because what I'm going for is what looks right, what scintillates to my eye and having a good amount of contrast is more scintillating for me. And speaking of, that also means I can go back into Kara here and add some more details, add some details to her hair, add another layer to it. I'm working with a much smaller round now and I'm really trying to leave those hair highlights, those streaks of light in her hair so that we can actually understand how her hair is falling and understand the masses of hair here. At this point, I stepped away. I allowed the illustration to dry overnight, and now I've got some of my favorite watercolor pencils. I have talked about watercolor pencils a lot here on the channel. I have reviewed several. So I am working with the Karen Dosh Museum Aquarelle. I am working with Derwin's Ink Tense, and I am working with Super Color 2 watercolor pencils for this. And what I am doing is I am mostly just tightening up a few details here and there. I love using watercolor pencils to add light highlights in a way that gouache might be a little too obvious, a little too heavy, a little bit too apparent. You can also, with good watercolor pencils, use a little bit of water to blend them back out so you can create these really nice, hazy, soft transitions. So I'm mostly using white, a cool yellow, a warm yellow, and a very light green just to add some highlights back into the clover and into the foliage. But I'm also using it to add some highlights to the flowers, particularly to the thistle which I am currently referencing on my computer screen as I'm working on this because I really want to capture that sort of a halo effect that you get with, with thistle as the light is hitting it from behind. So 
as you would have here. But I'm also using the white to kind of add some highlights back into the primroses and to the other flowers in this illustration. You guys can see I'm using a little bit of clean water just to blend that back out a little bit. So it's a lot of back and forth, figuring out what you like, figuring out what works for you, trying things. If it doesn't work, you can try redoing it. You can paint over it. But it's about taking risks and making mistakes, even when it seems very formulaic and like it is not about taking risks and making mistakes. And I spent a lot of time going back and forth with the watercolor pencils, adding it, blending it out, letting it dry. It's all about what I think looks right. And the only way you can really develop what you think looks right is you look at a lot of art, you also make a lot of art, and you work with reference. You study how the world looks, how you think about the world, and how you feel about the world. So at this point, I'm also adding in some stronger, very small details to her hair and her eyes. I'm adding in the freckles, the eyelashes. I'm kind of tightening up her hair. I'm adding some additional hairs that are falling across her face, as well as some stray hairs that have kind of broken free from the hole. So I have a tutorial where I talk about drawing and rendering hair and how to think about hair. And basically hair kind of moves in one mass, kind of like a fluid, but you do get some streams, some rivulets that kind of do what they want. Maybe that's based on static. Maybe that's based on those individual hair follicles. I couldn't really tell you. So now I've started working in some white gouache and I'm going to really use this on the clover blossoms and blend it out a lot to kind of capture that green gold center that ombres up into white. I'm going a little bit too blue with my clover so I'm using the gouache to kind of help modulate that. I'm also using the gouache to add a bit of rim lighting. This is going to add some contrast. It's going to add some delineation. It's going to make it easier for the viewer to understand what the objects are in the painting. So you can see I added a lot of white gouache and then I kind of blend it out using a little bit of clean water. This is a technique I've stolen from or borrowed, heavily borrowed from Chinese watercolor. I really like this technique and I think it's very useful in watercolor, especially in the kind of figurative storytelling watercolor that I like to do. So it's one that you'll see me use often. I'm also using white gouache to add some highlights to the hair as well as the reflective highlights to Kara's eyes. So my work is a mix of realistic and cartoony. I guess that's kind of a reflection of how I see the world and that's something that I love about art is that you can use art to show others how you see the world, your visions of the world, all the things you love, your best wishes for the world and that's how I use art. I, I use it to create a world ideally that people can escape into and regain their strength and regain their hope for a minute. I'm also going to splatter in just a little bit of white gouache, especially around the flowers. It's just going to help lighten things up and it's also going to help break up that border around the edges so that it's not quite so striking. And I'm so sorry about that train in the background. I live between two train tracks and they are just going all the time and they blare their horns during knockoff time so that people are not just on the tracks. So, I apologize, but that's one of the realities of being a real person who's recording audio in a not studio. So 
even though gouache and watercolor pencils are often some of the final stages of my watercolor art, sometimes I'll go back in and kind of refine things, add details, continue to adjust the contrast. And that's where taking frequent breaks can really pay off. It gives your eyes and your brain a chance to adjust. It gives the paper a chance to dry and it gives you time to think about what you want from the illustration. And that's one of the reasons I point out that creating art just for social media is not so great because that frenetic constant pace doesn't really give us enough time to analyze our work and it certainly doesn't encourage us to seek critique from trusted sources and actually be able to improve our art beyond a certain point. And while I'm not one to just rail against social media, I do think discussing its dangers in terms of making art is important because we are the ones who can decide to change the system. So I allowed my piece to dry fully. I am removing my low tack blue tape by pulling away at a 45 degree angle and this is because if it will tear and it often does tear it's going to tear into the white unused watercolor paper rather than tearing into your illustration and i have tried all kinds of different tapes all of them tear the crepe backed blue masking tape tears the least so here is my finished watercolor illustration. I had a lot of fun painting it and I really love how it turned out. Hopefully this tutorial was helpful and certainly inspiring for you guys. That's definitely my goal here with the channel is I really want to make art as accessible as possible. And ideally I'd like to help uplift cartoony art so that people can see it and respect it for the art form that it actually is. If you guys enjoy my art, you'll get more art tutorials over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup. In fact, this tutorial was brought to you thanks to my amazing, fantastic patrons. So thank you guys so much. Their names will be listed at the end of the video. If you're looking for more help with your watercolors, I've got loads of great tutorials here on the channel to help you out and get you painting. But if you would like more direct help every Friday or almost every Friday, I run a watercolor live stream. Currently, I'm demonstrating how to paint 18 different common varieties of flowers. So I hope I'll see you guys there. Come in, ask your questions, hang out, and let's enjoy a lovely Friday evening together. My streams start at 8 p.m. CST and run until I have finished painting whatever flower I'm working on. If you guys would like to check out what I'm working on as I'm working on it, you can join me over on Instagram at instagram.com slash natosoup. Please say hi. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'm always looking to follow more artists who are actually making art and not just big name accounts. So if you're over on Instagram and you're making art, give me a shout out. I'd love to say hi to you guys. So like I said, I really enjoyed working on this piece. I'm very pleased with how this piece turned out and I look forward to painting more of the same in the future since this is my happy place. This is what I find inspiring. If you enjoy this kind of art, you will find lots of it in my comic Seven Inch Kara, which I mentioned earlier, but you know I would be remiss if I didn't plug it twice since I am a comic artist. You can read it for free at seveninchkara.com and I'd love to hear what you think of it. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by purchasing a copy of Volume 1, Volume 2, or Lilliputian Living from my online shop, which I'll link in the description below. As always, it was a joy hanging out with you guys. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I hope this tutorial was helpful, useful, and inspiring, and I hope I'll see you guys again soon. Mm -hmm.